Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Regan. I am uh, the Vice President of the Australia-China Business Council of New South Wales, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I'm also the Chair of the Health Working Group, and uh, I have joining me today Alison Choi Flanagan, who is our new co-chair. And before I introduce Alison more formally, um, I'd just like to say is that it's great to have these events. As you know, ACBC works with its members to conduct a, a number of events, and we're very fortunate to have a health working group. We've recently reformed with a couple of new members on that, and we're always looking for topics and um, matters of interest. So hopefully today will be the start of that, and we have a couple more lined up before the end of the year. But uh, we're going to hear today from Professor Rob Phillips and Owen Zheng on engagement with China post-COVID, and it's a very timely and interesting topic. So before I do that, I would like to introduce my new co-chair and thank you very much, Alison, for taking on the role. Alison is a partner and leader of health and community at Hall and Wilcox. She has over 25 years of corporate, commercial and regulatory experience, specialising in the health, aged care, disability, life science and community sectors. She leads the firm's health and community industry group. And she's also well, very well published and she's on the Australia-China Business Council Committee and joins me today. So Alison's going to chair today's event. So Alison, over to you. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We have opportunities for questions as we go along throughout the session. So please put them in the Q&A and we'll answer them as well as we can during the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for the introduction and welcome to the session on COVID-19 and dealing with China uh, this is a challenging time, but also we've found with our clients and other um, <clears throat> organisation that this is a time for opportunities. And we're so lucky today to um, be able to have uh, interviews with two representatives of companies that have been actively working with China. Um, and they're showcasing Australian innovation, which is really exciting. So the ACBC is uh, Super excited to support Australian innovation and trade with China. I'd like to introduce you all to Professor Rob Phillips. He's the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of USCOM uh, Limited. He is the inventor and founder of USCOM Limited and took the company to public listing in 2003. Rob has more than 15 years experience as Chairman and CEO of an ASX listed medical technology company. Rob has successfully engineered the acquisition and integration of two international medical device companies and brought these new products to international markets by establishing a global web of Oscom's subsidiaries and distribution channels. Associate Professor Rob Phillips has a Doctor of Philosophy and a Master of Philosophy from the School of Medicine at the University of Queensland in Australia. He conceived and developed the Oscom 1A device and is the author of over 40 patents in cardiovascular monitoring and ultrasound, and has spent over 20 years collaborating, teaching and lecturing in China. Owen Zeng, Director, Morrison Innovations, is an entrepreneur, venture capitalist and project manager. Prior to his current role with Morrison Innovations, Owen has worked for New York and Hong Kong dual listed medical device manufacturers, as well as an Australian private and public healthcare providers. Inspired by Australia's exceptional R&D capacity, Owen co-founded Morrison Innovations in 2017. In early 2020, Owen successfully attracted private investment to establish HygieMed Australia, a company specialising in an innovative range of medical consumers and personal protective equipment. Owen is now working with the medtech community to bring more innovative technologies and devices into the market via strengthened domestic and global supply chain. I'm going to interview Rob first. Um, if you have any questions for him or Owen, please feel free to add them into the Q&A and we'll deal with them um, later on. But I've got some questions of Rob. We've heard so much about the COVID-19 vaccine, but let's talk a bit about COVID-19 treatment. And also, what, let's talk a bit about post-COVID-19 symptoms. There's not been much discussion about what symptoms people um, have um, had during COVID-19 and the longer-term um, detriment to their health if they have had it. So, Rob, what is post-COVID-19 syndrome? Look, 
COVID is a really complex issue. And it's a really complex disease. And uh, it's been with us at least for, in the public domain, at least for the last uh, 18 to 20 months. Um, although in 2019, there have been sporadic reports of the disease being located and genetically being identified. Uh, I guess uh, in early 2020 was when it really hit the pages and started to disseminate very quickly. It's been a very dynamic disease. It's uh, like most viruses, it changes all the time. And the fact that it's now infecting at least 200 million and possibly more than a billion people on the planet, it's a billion and a half, it sets up an environment where it becomes prime, if you like, for uh, mutation. And so this creates all kinds of challenges. It's a virus and it attacks the immune system or, or um, stimulates a powerful immune response. It's a very individualised response. People respond to the disease differently. Some people are asymptomatic. Up to 80 to 90% of folk who get it are totally asymptomatic. And yet another somewhere around about half a percent uh, of people die. So the range of responses are really complex and the systems that it affects uh, ranging um, from lung infection, which is where the virus initially arrives uh, through aerosolized contact and then dissemination through the bloodstream to the major organs uh, of the body. And then you get um, organ failure and all the traditional signs that you get with sepsis and septic shock. Um, there is no treatment that we know of. It's basically still supportive. So supplemental oxygen and cardiovascular support. These are the only two ways that we know to make patients better. And we stimulate their immune system if we can. And this is what vaccines and uh, such do. The problem, of course, of course, with vaccines and the biggest challenge with them is that you're chasing a moving target. And that is that um, the original COVID that we started out with in the beginning of 2020 is still alive and well, but it's been superseded by the Alpha variant and then the Delta variant, of course. And uh, interestingly, there have been thousands of mutations of the COVID, original COVID disease, but uh, not all of them have sort of moved progressively forward. The alpha and the delta have become more contagious. And as, as yet, we still even don't know what the mortality associated with these two variants are. We suspect some of the early data said that they were less, uh, less dangerous, so they had a lower mortality, but much more contagious. But the number in terms of the contagion of, of the alpha was about 50 times as contagious as the original COVID. But the delta is approximately 1,000 times. So this is why delta is causing such an enormous response now. But if you look at the history of, of infectious diseases, and uh, there's a lot of well-documented, well-covered work, work on the CDC and CDC allied websites, what you see is these viral infections and they occur every year annually. They come in waves and they, they have explosions and then receive explosions, then receive explosions, then receive. For example, the 2000, um, uh, the 1918 flu basically had three great waves, four great waves, and then disappeared, basically became endemic. Now we're trusting that the same thing will happen here with this uh, this COVID disease, because the, the pre precedent, of course, was in 2003, when the SARS epidemic hit um, Hong Kong. And um, that was put China on, on a red alert. And I was involved in that. Our devices were brought in to China and approved to actually deal with these infectious diseases in advance. So we've had a lot of experience with this. and. Uh, but it, it, it petered out, if that's the right way to put it. And, and of course, the more dangerous it is, 
is the grade of the install base. And at the moment, we can imagine or expect that somewhere around about uh, a billion or two billion people will have had unconfirmed um, uh, antibodies related to COVID infection. It was last week, I think some amazing information came out from India and they did testing across a number of provinces or states in India. And what they found was that something like 67% of randomly chosen people of various ages had COVID Delta um, antibodies. So that means three, two thirds of the population of India have been infected and had contact or been vaccinated. So it's a terrifyingly widespread disease. Um, it's common, contagious, and sometimes fatal, and it's dynamic. So it's got all of the, uh, all of the challenging features of a, um, um, a clinical disease that we still haven't resolved. We haven't resolved how we live with it, how we deal with it. And what sort of like the long-term um, symptoms have you seen in relation to people who've tested positive for COVID-19? Well, it, it, again, it's a very personal disease because, uh, and, and you know, it's interesting, one of the big things in medicine now is about precision medicine. And what that does is says that most people have different compositions, different immune systems, different biochemical communicators, messaging systems. And so if you catch the same dose of a virus that I catch, it's unlikely that we'll express the same symptoms. You might get it more seriously than me. I may not get it seriously at all. I may, though, have long-term sequels to it. And uh, this is the interesting thing about COVID as we know now. These co long COVIDs and post-COVID syndromes are the persistence of symptoms after the initial infectious period of sort of like uh, one week or three or four days to three or four weeks. And these are persistent, ongoing, systemic symptoms, uh, which include cognitive impairment, um, drowsiness, pain, headaches, all kinds of uh, difficult to identify symptoms, but they are obviously real and they do persist. And they're not related. And it's interesting that folk who have asymptomatic initial COVID infections can have very serious post-COVID disease. And so it's easy to ask the questions. It's very, very difficult to give comprehensive answers. And we can see this at the moment. We've got uh, seven and a half billion world experts on COVID but the people who actually know about COVID don't know very much at all. It's a dynamic field. It's changing all the time. But I think the message is really clear, and that is we have to learn to live with infectious diseases. And, you know, I remember being asked about COVID uh, very early on, and my sort of response was, it's not so much COVID-19 that worries me. It's COVID-20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And these are the things that, going forward, we're going to have to deal with as a community. There is no doubt COVID's changed the way we live. It's changed um, the way we do business and it's changed geopolitics. It's been incredibly impactful. And it's, a, it's been, if you like, a salutary lesson in how to better coordinate and better work together rather than to alienate and fight against each other. It should be a unifying force. And, you know, to me, this is kind of, where us comms are a part of what we do. The concept of medical diplomacy is absolutely critical. We are no longer nationally divided. We're universally united in the sense that the disease knows no national boundary, nor religious or whatever. We all get it in the end and nobody's responsible for it. It's a disease and there will be others after it. So we need to coordinate, work together better and uh, have a concerted strategy going forward with how to deal with it. You said that, I mean, that's interesting. You mentioned cognitive impairment. I've read so that there's been a study that there's been some effect of cognitive impairment, even with oh, people yeah. who had no symptoms. Um, what about well, like 
heart, heart disease or lung disease? Have you seen any of that? One of the big deals, one of the big deals, you know, USCOM specialises in technologies which measure pulmonary function and cardiovascular function. And it's interesting because the COVID is actually a, uh, an infectious disease of the lungs, but which is complicated systematically with immune responses, very complex immune responses. So our patients actually, actually don't die from the infection. Most of them die from cardiovascular failure, which is a response of the septic infection. So our devices basically measure non-invasively lung function and cardiovascular function. We're the world leaders and we're, we're recommended by the Chinese National Health and Medical uh, uh, Commission as the preferred method to measure, to, to manage severe COVID because we can rapidly identify the changes in the circulation which precipitate death and direct therapy appropriately and accurately. So uh, our device has been really at the center of COVID um, especially acute COVID and early COVID. And we've now been involved in the establishment of more than 50 infectious disease centres uh, in China. And these are the kinds of sort of social uh, activities that we're going to have to start looking at. We are going to have to set up infectious disease specialised um, uh, centres so that we can deal with these periodic outbreaks. And uh, it's been an interesting part to be involved in that, in that process. The, the second phase now are these sort of long COVID, post-COVID um, uh, symptoms. And one of the consequences are that you get cardiovascular and pulmonary fibrosis because it's an infection. The response to infections is, uh, is fibrosis uh, often, but particularly in the lungs. So many of these folk we're finding now at the end of three months have restrictive physiology. Their breath, their capacity to breathe is diminished. And so what we need to do is monitor these folk. And we don't know how long this will go for. Will this condition get worse and worse and people die in 12 or 18 months? Or will they resolve and, and heal and recover? There is no longitudinal study. This is real-time science, and it shouldn't be complicated with politics. This is about people and survival, and we need to take it seriously. We need to look at it carefully, and there is an awful lot of work that's going to need to be done. The, the uh, evidence at the moment is still confounding. Um, you know, we know it's an infectious disease. We know it's dangerous. It's contagious and sometimes fatal, sometimes asymptomatic. We don't understand why. Are different races protected? America was hit absolutely terribly, even though they've got the highest health spend in the world. Why is that? You know, these are questions that we need to know. And why say it has China's been such a very low uh, level of infection? It's not all just about management and control. There are, you would want to look at the genetic components or causes associated with these things worldwide. So there's a huge amount of information that we need to understand. And it's not just the COVID, it's understanding the foundations of infectious diseases and the consequences that it's going to have for us all going forward. That's really interesting. Um, and it's really exciting to see um, your products and their saturation in the Chinese market. Um, one comment I make is it seems like China's a little bit ahead of us because um, the Australian government's still dealing with vaccines. We've not actually moved into the development of um, infectious disease centres, but I'm sure it will come. Um, I just well, really China has vaccinated over a billion people. Yes. 1.1 billion people. Yeah. So I think, you know, That's in some respects, we should yeah, learn from their, their experience. Tell me how, um, how did you break into the Chinese market? I'm sure there's lots of companies listening how do you go about doing that? Look, there is no simple answer. It's time, persistent and persistence and focus. You know, it's like any other market. We went to China, um, as I said, on the, on the, on the uh, wave of SARS, and we stayed there because clinicians there were very interested in what we were doing. And I've been lecturing there for 15-odd years, um, attached to the universities there, some of the universities there. 
We've now set up a wholly owned subsidiary in Beijing. I spend maybe four to six months of the year here. Um, it's understanding the system, working with uh, the regulators um, and um, having relationships. So we've got a board member who's a Beijing-based um, member and our Director of International Operations has had an established history in health management in Beijing. So knows a lot of people, you know, Teresa Gura, Go and um, I think those things help. You do need to have an interface with the community and understand. I think uh, China's been the sort of object of many sort of social invasions. And I think, you know, we need to work together is really what it's about. If you go there and you make contributions, and I think the last five year um, plan identified that China needed entrepreneurs, medical academics, and bioscience. So our company ticks all those boxes from my point of view, from the academic point of view, from the entrepreneurial side of things. And our biosense, biosciences, we've got something like 20 or 30 registered IP uh, components in China. So, you know, it's uh, like any other market. You, you look at what's necessary, you make some assessments of it, you don't get it always right, and you uh, persist, I think, is the way to do it. But you do need to have partners and you do need to work with those people. I think that's a good answer. I mean, my experience with working with businesses in China, it's very much about um, relationships, um, you know, Sorry. building that trusted relationship. Well, well, I think that's the... universal, Alison. You know, Sorry? It doesn't matter what you... I think that's universal. No matter where you go, for business to be successful, you need to have good relationships and partnerships. And I think, you know, that, that's a global message and a national message and a geopolitical message. And that is we work together, we recognise each other's differences, but we respect and uh, collaborate. That's a very powerful tool that... Uh, is a good foundation for trade and uh, cooperation and commerce. One of some of the challenges you experienced um, in terms of a regulatory approval for a medical device and intellectual property, uh, political, etc., dealing with China. Well, look, intellectual property is always sort of uh, identified as a defect in the Chinese system. And I think you've got to give credit that it's been they didn't come, they haven't come in the last sort of 200 years from the Westminster system and the development of concepts of IP. It's really only been the last five, you know, last 10, 15 years where they've actually been in that international domain where IP is recognised. Uh, they have taken amazing steps to regulate and normalise, standardise and develop an IP system that's analogous to that that we consider in the West to be the right way. And they've done huge, huge efforts to that. And I previously didn't um, take much time with IP in China because it was very difficult to prosecute, expensive to defend. Now that's totally different. Different. You can actually prosecute IP successfully. You can defend trademarks and copyrights. So I think it's, uh, it's a much more... Uh, comfortable environment IP now than it has ever been and it's continuing to develop. So I think that's that's a, a an important thing. The regulatory environment is always catastrophic. <laughs> and I say that it's just regulators, more and more regulators. When you're in a small company, we're regulated the same way as BHP and Rio are. And if we go to China, we're, we're regulated the same way as GE and Philips. This is the way life works. And China had developed a regulatory environment, which again is parallel and not much different to US, Europe, and Australia for that matter. So it's, it's, there's nothing unique. It's all about process and it's about management and control and regulation. Medicine's um, important and consequential and has impacts if it doesn't work. So being regulated is probably painful, but in some respects necessary. And uh, we accept that. We follow the path. It always takes longer, costs more than you could ever imagine, 
and they always find the most difficult of questions to ask you. That's life. <laughs> Tell me about how you, I mean, I think a lot of people on the call would be a bit jealous of you, but how did you manage to obtain the endorsement of the Chinese government? Look, I, I think you just go there and you understand what happens in the environment. As I said, the, the five-year plan recommends academic, um, entrepreneurial and bioscience as the areas that they need most, and they will do whatever to encourage you to go there, to set up, to manufacture, to develop. I collaborate and write um, papers with a number of different institutions in China, academic institutions. I'm a professor at a couple of places, one place there and one place in Australia. And I lecture maybe 20 times a year there. So it's... It's not as if you just sort of walk in and say, look, you know, I'm going to tell you people what to do. They've got an incredibly complex and increasingly uh, developed medical system. If we look around the world five years ago, 10 years ago, there were established leaders who could sit um, and, and, and sort of uh, evaluate everybody else. I think many of the places in Southeast Asia with their improved economic development have an, had an accompanying improvement in the standards of education and medical practice. And that is continuing. There is a fixation on doing things better and that will reach a point where um, their standards are very much uh, to be admired, not to sort of uh, to be challenged. So to get that, was, is, was there a competitive right. process or is it just that they recognised you? Is it, do you make an well, application? Look, we've or? been there, we've worked hard, we've made contributions that were valuable. And I think that's always important, you know, and that's the same in any market that you move into. Uh, we sort of comply with local, um, provincial and national uh, government expectations. That's what you would do in Australia, state laws, federal laws, it's easy. And um, yeah, you, you contribute to the system. I think uh, people do recognise that. I think in China, they are very much about encouraging what they see as the right direction. And so we got our AAA uh, commercial rate, rating. We got our high torch, um, high, national high tech enterprise uh, listing, which means we're a tech, we're a, a company of high technical um, uh, recognised capability nationally. To us, that's a really important thing, and it's a part of developing IP. It's contributing clinically in terms of saving lives, developing um, infectious disease outposts. We do an awful lot in this in China, you know? and uh, those things. You don't ask for, but people do notice that you do that after a long time. And placing your medical devices into the Chinese hospital, was that through tender or how was that arranged? Look, we there isn't an easy way to work out distribution in China, in the US, in Europe. Every system, every country, every province, every state, every hospital does it differently. Everybody would love a simple formula. You just have one person, give them a call, give them your information, show them your data, and people will make assessments on the basis of science. That would suit me perfectly. It doesn't always work like that. So you use whatever pathways are available. We use a sort of sub-distribution network and also part direct distribution. Direct distribution when you're a small company is very, very difficult. Uh, very expensive and hard to manage. So we, we use um, sub-distributors to, to get our work done, but we do also keep in touch at a state and national level with regard to tenders uh, and compliance to tenders to make sure that we do everything right. You know, same as you do in Australia, I guess. You know. And what do you see as the opportunities um, post COVID-19 in Australia and China going forward? Look, it's, it's terrifying actually. There, there is two components, say from us from this point of view. Um, one is the 
as one which is a cardiovascular palm, cardiovascular monitoring technology, which allows you to identify abnormalities in the circulation, which may ultimately lead to death, and to choose the appropriate intervention, whether it's fluid, inotropes, or vasoactives. But you can do it within five or ten minutes, and that's fantastic, and that's why it's adopted. We're in five of the top ten. Uh, pediatric hospitals in the US and we'll be in seven of the top 10 pediatric hospitals in the US, principally for management of sepsis. This is our, our bread and butter. But it's also for heart failure. It's also for hypertension, preeclampsia. So we see the expanded focus and, and, and China are very systematic about this. They've identified that infectious disease is going to be something big going forward and they need to deal with it. They are setting up infectious disease hospitals all over the place. And they will be, for each year, whatever comes along, whatever next year's infectious disease is, they will still deal with it in this systematic, networked, networked way. We will be a part of that. Now, the post-COVID stuff, and, and you know, hopefully Australia will get to that in a few years' time, and maybe the US. Europe are starting to do it already. So these will open doors for us going forward. Post-COVID, with these pulmonary infections, you want to see what happens to these people's lungs and how you best treat them. We don't know what the natural history of the disease is yet. We don't know what the outcomes are going to be, and we don't know what the best therapies are. The first step in that process is accurately monitoring the changes in pulmonary function that may suggest, and I think the, the data says somewhere about uh, 12 to 17 percent of folk who have serious COVID have pulmonary fibrosis at the end of three months. Now that's that's very unhealthy. What we know about pulmonary fibrosis is it's not a good disease to have. It's difficult to reverse, but it may be different. The COVID pulmonary fibrosis may be different to other pulmonary fibrosis. We don't know. So. Home monitoring is going to be really important, pulmonary home monitoring. We've just released a new technology which is cloud-based, uh, app-mediated, uh, totally wireless induction charge. You just blow in it. It measures very precisely using high-fidelity high, um, digital ultrasound. It automatically communicates to your fat phone in your pocket, your app. That communicates to your local doctor who has all of your medical records there. He looks at that and says, look, you're not looking too good. Try this and then do another one. So that kind of telehealth at an integrated level is really powerful. And I think that's one of the great things about this COVID thing. And that is it has made us suddenly start to evaluate the opportunities associated with telehealth. And these are the kind of things that allow us to deal with, say, 2 billion people who've had COVID who may have ongoing pulmonary fibrosis. So it's changing the way that we approach systems. And we expect this to be uh, this new device, which is the le world leading technology in this space, will be adopted very rapidly in China and become quite widespread, as well as in Europe, it's already started. And we're just about to get our approvals in the US. So from our point of view, uh, it's probably the ideal space for a medical technology company to be. You're confronted with a, uh, a global health dilemma and you have the solutions that improve that and improve care, save people's lives. That's what we do. That's what we seek out. It's interesting, and I agree completely, that um, e-health is an opportunity, but also from what you were saying, that China's investing in their infectious disease centres. So anyone who provides services to those centres, whether it's PPE or consulting staff or medical um, services, there's opportunities there as well. Another thing that I picked up from what you were saying is um, how your equipment sort of monitors um, for potentially, um, you know, pre preeclampsia, those sort of conditions or sepsis. It would be really interesting, um, you know, because you're in China, you're using, so many people are using your equipment. Are you collecting data for research purposes? Um, I collaborate with people that I work with. So we look at data. We can, 
the use of cloud-based data is, is ideal, but there are a whole lot of challenges worldwide. So to set up a sort of a data centre where you just acquire everybody's uh, clinical measures, there are all kinds of ethical, social and legal complications with that. I've, I've never understood why your health was uh, less important than your privacy, but that's a social issue, not, not a personal one. You know, if I get sick, I would like my clinician to have every bit of my um, medical background to make a more informed decision about whether I'm well or not well and what I've previously been on and uh, how I've responded to it or if I'm allergic to any kind of drug or medication. Um, it will come, but I think it's a slow thing. But I think at the front line of that whole process is high quality digital analytic measures. And we measure the central uh, health uh, parameters, if you like, of cardiovascular pulmonary. And these are systems which are responsible for about 75 to 80% of global mortality. So our devices assist in the treatment and the management of diseases that are responsible for 75% to 80% of all global mortality. How we organise that and we then supply that and feed that into software is really not difficult. It's the hardware at the front end that's really hard. That'll take 15 years to do. The software in the middle, you can pay someone $10,000 and they'll come up with a beautifully integrated solution and a lovely graphical interface and it will display it. But unless the measures that you have at the front end are high fidelity, high accuracy, and they deal with hearts, lungs and, and vessels, it's not going to be of high clinical value. And that's really where I see the future going. But I think it's going to be a social collaboration with people like Google, Apple, et cetera. And we're already working with these companies. You know, we're on the International Space Station. We are doing research with the, the big tech companies. Uh, they need front ends that are, that are high fidelity and have high clinical yield. So it's an exciting time for medicine and we're an exciting place for that. And China's our sort of... Uh, our main head, uh, beach stone, if you like. Yeah, it's a place that uh, we've worked at and been encouraged and uh, have been successful in. Um, it's a good time. You know, and it's a good time to have things that help communities and help people. It's great. And it's a, a wonderful success story for an Australian business. And we're so lucky to have you today for me to ask you questions. Um, does Thanks. anyone else want to post any questions in the Q&A? I have, um, I mean, in relation to, um, for Rob, in relation to um, the data, obviously there are privacy laws that protect our personal information, but it is possible to aggregate DA identified data. And I just think your company would be a wonderful resource um, where we can find, you know, you said, you know, um, 12 to 17% of serious cases um, go on to have, um, you know, pulmonary complications. So that statistic itself can be used in developing treatments or trends and using AI to, to be able to identify trends um, so that uh, clinicians can better treat people. So much work needs to be done, Alison, you know, and yeah. I, I guess from the point of, of, of clinical medicine, that's exciting because we are learning more daily and we have the tools which will give us the opportunities to look into the future. Yeah, and as That's you said, good. personalised medicine, you know, being able to target treatments for different populations, et cetera. Um, that's well, really what's going to happen someone, in the future. Yeah, why does someone get COVID, doesn't even notice it, and someone else dies? I have and no idea. And if we work that out, we know who to focus on, don't we? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> the earlier we work out who to focus on, the better, I think. <laughs> Oh, well, so um, I've just got, um, I'm going to interview Owen next and then hopefully we'll get some Q&A at the end. Um, but thank you so much for answering those questions. I found it absolutely fascinating. And um, I think Australia is really supportive of uh, businesses such as yours being so successful, um, yeah. not only in China, but internationally. But um, I personally thank you um, for all the work that you've done to help 
um, treat people with COVID-19. I think that's um, a, a community contribution. So I think, you know, with the frontline workers, I think uh, businesses like you should be thanked uh, for the work that you were doing in, in terms of um, making better outcomes for patients. Um, I'm going to ask some questions for Owen now. We've got a little bit of time, so I, I do want to get the questions in for him. Um, Owen, can you tell me about um, Morrison Innovations Technology and what it does? Oh, um, thanks, thanks, Alison. Um, actually, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank ACDC to give us this opportunity to uh, to in this conversation with our old friend Rob. So actually, we are we are old friends. Um, you know, I visit uh, Ascon's office. Uh, I actually uh, and understand uh, the cutting edge technology actually way before COVID. Um, and then uh, I really echo this Rob <laughs> that actually the post COVID uh, opportunities and challenges, you know, like in terms of you know, you know, not only the geopolitical uh, issues but also like uh, regulatory compliance, IP, e health. Actually, we. Uh, uh, I think we have a lot of, uh, um, um, you know, common, um, you know, um, topics, I think, that we can uh, do in the following events with ACDC. Um, um, and then this challenge is actually not only limited in China, but also, I think, in Australia recently that, you know, we are how the regulatory uh, 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 dilemma and then, you know, with in our own, like, uh, vaccine rollout, I think it's not only uh, one country, Thing, but also to the whole world. So, uh, in, like uh, just to conclude, that um, most importantly, we just want to work together, uh, unite, coordinate, uh, and and I think I really echo this Rob that after all, business is all about relationship and trust. So without this foundation, nothing happens. Okay, and, and I go back to uh, Alison's uh, uh, question. So Morrison Innovations that been promoting value-based uh, healthcare uh, via our unique MedTech pathway solutions since 2017. Uh, this solution is actually to uh, accelerate Australian R&D by bringing the contract development and manufacturing CBMO um, uh, solutions uh, plus uh, venture capital, uh, plus go-to-market execution uh, all together under the same umbrella. So uh, in 2019, uh, we transformed a GMP uh, mobile assembly line in Shenzhen into a uh, ISO 13485 um, uh, medical device prototyping uh, and pilot production facility. Um, that's you know where we uh, started. Um, our, our hard work and solutions soon been paid back uh, by the soaring uh, PPE needs. Firstly, from China, and, and then globally in 2020. So we quickly attract uh, private investment uh, in establishing HygieMet Australia. So under this grant, so we design high quality um, and innovative PPEs from um, the experts based in Brisbane, uh, Sydney, and Adelaide um, to respond to the unmet needs due to the COVID. Uh, then we manufacture in Shenzhen, uh, and now with our supply chain, um, and our business partners from Guangzhou, Jiamen, Hefei, Kaohsiung, uh, Japan, and uh, Malaysia. So, so now we are distributing nationwide, um, exporting to uh, Southeast Asia, Pacific nations, and then we are negotiating OEM um, for global distributors such as uh, Aspen Medical and CH2. Uh, our, our business aligned with the uh, uh, OST industry and the MTP Connect and identified megatrend, uh, health aging and value-based healthcare in two, uh, 2020. So actually we've been uh, advocate for the uh, value-based health healthcare since uh, uh, 2017, uh, way ahead of uh, the MTP Connect because we realize the current funding model uh, and our commercialization model uh, probably need some systematically change to, uh, um, to, uh, uh, to be able to be more competitive. Um, uh, we are committed to invest into the Australian R&D 
um, and bring more quality medical devices into the global market, focus on cardiovascular and, and pulmonary diseases. Actually, we uh, actually we uh, invested a city funding and uh, uh, another technology uh, to probably the, uh, you know trying to achieve the, the same uh, uh, effect uh, of ASCOM. Probably we can be ASCOM, um, you know, uh, 2.0 but hopefully not taking uh, another 20 years. So that's our goal. Um, yeah, so, so that's what, what we did. Uh, and then we really uh, focused also interested in to uh, IVF, uh, precise medicine, uh, as we talked about. Uh, we look forward to working with more Australian med tech companies such as ESCOM and scale up our capacity uh, with our unique med tech pathways to accelerate the uh, commercialization progress. Thank you. So um, tell me about your experience with uh, dealing with China supplying, I think you supply PPE into China, yes? Yes, actually that we, uh, uh, the, the current product we, we commercialize is PPE, but actually we have uh, 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 at least four projects under, under the line, yeah. So what are they, masks or what are they exactly? No, 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 uh, as I mentioned, actually also like uh, we, we, uh, we invest into wearables, uh, you know, like a uh, precise medicine. Yes, so that, uh, that, that uh, and then we're looking into the IVF uh, associated uh, uh, products and services so that we are, uh, so probably uh, uh, Pajim is, uh, is a very successful story. So everyone say, you know, like, oh, you, you got a PPE bar. But uh, yeah, this is definitely the, one of our successful story, but uh, we do want to uh, work with the, the med tech community and, uh, and bring more, um, you know, like uh, 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 medical devices into the market as we, we understand uh, Australia really have a very, very good uh, early stage R&D capacity. Um, uh, but you know, it, but it, the, the currently the trend, uh, the transformation or the commercialization process, I think, is just a bit too long. So the cost too high. So that uh, um, uh, and then end up with that hard to scale up. Yeah. So, like, well, do you have um, business partners in China, and how's the relationship? How did you um, build that relationship with businesses in China? Uh, I think that, 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 that is it. The question goes to Rob. No, it's for you. How uh, did sorry. you How did you build your business in China? Uh, yes, I think that my, my story is much more simpler because I I, I grew up in China. I get uh, you know uh, families, uh, um, you know like uh, colleagues, previous colleagues, you know friends. So that uh, um, um, and then we. Uh, uh, just based on my uh, personal experience, I work with a lot of um, you know like. Uh, uh, for example, my right, so that I, I uh, work with them for quite a long time uh, and uh, know their stories well. Um, yep. And it's useful to have that background. So, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities for other Australian um, businesses in Australia and China post COVID nineteen? Sure. Uh, I think the, um, the op actually, from my perspective, the opportunities are obvious. Um, there will be big investments into R&D and uh, clinical trials. Um, the medical device and pharmaceutical industry actually boomed during the pandemic. And many manufacturers, like uh, we partnered this, um, um, you know, they, they find out, oh, gee, you know, the gross margin uh, is, is much higher than the electric products they used to uh, uh, you know, manufacture. Um, uh, in the meantime, um, I think, now the, uh, um, the Chinese manufacturers um, also realize actually there are gaps between their R&D capacity and uh, uh, the, the market expectations, especially from the Western uh, country. Um, there are also big gaps uh, in uh, expertise in the compliance, regulatory uh, and global market entry. So, this gap gaps will see more Chinese pharmaceutical and uh, um, medical devices companies invest heavily into R&D, uh, new product development, and clinical trials that to bring high quality products into the global market. 
So the absolute dollars are expected to be outpaced in US for the first time uh, in the following three to five years. Uh, this investment is a great opportunity for Australian medtech companies um, to fill in the market, uh, especially uh, as, as I mentioned in the cardiovascular and uh, pulmonary uh, diseases, IVF, uh, precise medicine, and digital health. Um, yeah, so that's the opportunity I see. Um, also, uh, but also the, the challenges I think is also obvious. Um, uh, the biggest challenges um, I, I can see is the travel and the communication cost will be very high. As I think that the Rob can also add a lot of stories into that. Uh, now travel to um, China, so I think at least two or three weeks, right? Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah that's really yeah. interesting, Rob. I mean, you've been traveling to China during COVID-19 yeah. um, for business. Do you want to talk a bit about, you said that you're on a, a diet of cold chicken feet. Let's talk about that. What's yeah. it like it's, um, currently living in Chengzhou? Has Rob, you're, 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 you're mute. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're in um, mute. And what is um, life like on the other side day to day as we're currently in lockdown in Sydney? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's pretty interesting because uh, I think my retirement plan is to write a uh, consumer's guide to quarantining around the world. <laughs> uh, and, and Owen's particularly correct, and that is it has just sort of filled the world with quicksand as far as travel and communication goes. You know, we all Zoom and we do that kind of stuff, but the reality is that business is made on face to face meetings and being in place and spending time there. You can't condense it to a 30 minute communication. Um, and uh, yeah, three weeks full quarantine is a long, long time. You know, you, you start to lose body mass, <laughs> you start to get isolated, <laughs> all kinds of things happen to you. But yeah, you know, I've done the two weeks in Australia and I spent time in Singapore and everybody's got a slightly different uh, way to do it. And I, I must say, I do prefer the Singapore method where you go along, you put your thumb in and they say, welcome back, Professor Phillips, and you go through, you get your PCR done and you go home and they send you a result in three hours that says your PCR is negative, go about your business. And uh, if you're not, then they send you to hospital, you know. But uh, I think with the increasing complexity with vaccinations and infections and the the high level of negativity in some of these reliable tests that we previously had, they're, they're sensitive only for previous versions or pre previous forms of COVID. So, uh, for example, you know, vaccinations now on, um, are becoming less effective on different variants because they were devised for other variants. So it's going to become very difficult to keep this formulaic, you will stay for three weeks until you don't have um, symptoms. I don't know where it's going to end up to tell you the truth, but I can tell you at the moment it's really difficult because most countries don't want other people going there. So they make it very difficult for you to get visas. They make it very difficult for you to travel. You've got to do incredible prerequisites. And then when you arrive, you've got to be locked up for two or three weeks. It's just very difficult to do business. It will be a delight. I remember when I could uh, be sitting having lunch in Sydney at the head office and decide that I'd go to Beijing and I'd be on the plane at 9 o'clock and in the office at 7.30 in the morning. I'd walk straight through because of the APEC card. I'd walk straight through, no sort of uh, uh, migration or anything. And I think of those days and think, wow, I wish they'd come back again. But we will see. Over the next 12 months, months, I think we're going to have to take very pragmatic decisions. Do we stay connected? Do we travel? Is international business a priority? How do we maintain it? It's, it's got to open up somehow or other, and uh, I'm looking forward to that every day. I think that's a good way to, to finish the session, and I would like to very much thank Rob and Owen um, sharing your insights. I certainly learned a lot today, um, and I hope that um, the people that have joined us on the call will um, the call will, uh, the uh, session has been recorded um, and I would like to um, let you know that we do have um, another session coming up um, for the ACBC um, 
health and aging uh, subgroup. We've got a health summit on the 7th of September, um, which will be a hybrid event. Please join us for that. Um, and the ACBC will be sending uh, an event poll to provide feedback. Oh, look, she's provided the uh, polling at the end. Please complete uh, this feedback form to help us plan for future events. But I thought that this was absolutely fantastic. And I do commend uh, Robin Owen and your organisations for what you've been doing. And personally, I, I have a built, big, big passion in supporting Australian business um, succeed everywhere. Um, it's so exciting to see, and we wish you every success in the future. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Alison. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.